Hilchois Bikurim, Moshar Matnes Kuhuna Shabak Vulin, Perek Achad Osar. The laws of the first fruits and the other Kohanic gifts that apply in the land of Israel. Chapter 11. I'm dedicating this class to my new son, born yesterday, with the help of Hashem, and a tremendous Hashgacha Pratis, divine providence, that the first Rambam of his life is about the mitzvah of redeeming a firstborn son, which, God willing, I'll have the merit to do in about 30 days. 31 days, we do it on the 31st day, because we want a full 30 days of life to elapse. And then we do the mitzvah. And so today, we're learning about uh, these laws. I even have my bracelet to prove it. So here we go. It says that Amam Halacha Aleph, Mitzvah Saseh. It's a positive commandment, Lifdois Kol Ishmi Yisrael, that every Jew should redeem. Benoi Shehu Bechayr Le'imai HaYisraelis. His son, who is first born, to his mother, who is a regular Israelite. The Ramam uses the word regular Israelite, because we're going to see in a second, if she's a Kohen or a Levi, then we don't do this redemption. And also has to be firstborn to the mom, even if it's not firstborn to the dad. The father could have been married to somebody else, had a child with her. Now he's married to the second woman. If it's her firstborn, the father has the obligation to redeem the son. Shanemar, this is the picture on the screen, Pidyon Aben. It's a very rare Jewish tradition. They bring the baby into the shul, cover it with gold jewelry, as we'll learn about the ceremony in today's chapter. So the Pasuk says, what's the source for this obligation? Shanemar, because it says in the Pasuk, called Peter Rechem Li. Hashem says, all the babies that open up the womb belong to me. The Nemar, and it also says, Ach Padoi Sifde, Eis Bechayr Ha'adam. However, redeem, you shall redeem. You shall surely redeem the firstborn of people, firstborn sons. Commentaries explain that the Rambam doesn't bring a verse which describes the father's obligation because really, essentially, it's the son's obligation to redeem himself. Except that a son is tiny, he's not bar mitzvah yet, so he can't redeem himself. So in the meantime, they put it on the father. But the essential obligation belongs to the son himself. It happens to be, I'm a firstborn, my son is a firstborn. So it's a bukhar, son of a bukhar. It says that I'm a malacha beis, ve'ena isha chayeves liftes as bina. A woman, the mother, is not obligated to redeem her son. Shehachayev liftes as atzmai, hu shehachayev liftes as bina. Because only a person who is obligated to redeem himself, i.e. a man, were he to be a bukhar, he would have to redeem himself, hu shehachayev liftes as bina, he's a person who is obligated to redeem his son. But a mother who has no obligation to redeem herself doesn't have to redeem her son. Notice that Amam says she doesn't have to. But that means if she wants to, she could. And indeed, if there's no father around, the custom today is that the woman redeems her son. If the father transgressed and didn't redeem the son, when the boy grows up and he becomes bar mitzvah, he has to redeem himself. If a father ended up in a situation where he was a firstborn, he was never redeemed, and now he has a firstborn son who he also has to redeem. Who do you redeem first? Jews weren't so rich back then. You have to redeem yourself first and then your son because your own mitzvah comes first. Even if you only have enough to redeem one of you, you redeem yourself first because your son will take care of himself later. What if you have in front of you a mitzvah to redeem your firstborn son and it's also time to go to Jerusalem for the Yom for the holiday. Now, the Ainloi Kedei Lazev you don't have enough money for both. What do you do? Here we have a problem of what's called mitzvah oiveres, a passing mitzvah. To go to Jerusalem for the pilgrimage, it's a passing opportunity. After the holiday, you can't go. But your son, even if you miss the proper day, you can redeem him later. So you would think you go to the pilgrimage first. It says that Rambam Poydez Benoi V'achakach Elul Regal. Nevertheless, you redeem your son first, and then you go to Ali Elul Regal, to the, to the pilgrimage. Shanemar, because it says in the verse, look at the order. First it says, redeem all firstborn of your sons. And afterwards it says, don't come to my holy temple, and don't see my face empty-handed, rather bring a sacrifice. Which means that firstborn son comes before the obligation to bring the pilgrimage sacrifice going to Jerusalem. When somebody redeems their son, this is a uh, ceremony of Pidyan Aben. When somebody redeems their son, Mevarech, the father makes the bracha, Asher Kichanu B'mitzvaysa V'tzivanu Al Pidyan Aben. Blessed is Hashem who sanctified us with his, with his commandments and commanded us to redeem or about redeeming the firstborn. V'chayzenu Mevarech She'achiyanu. Then he goes and makes a second blessing, She'achiyanu. V'achar kach neisen ha'pidyan la'koyi. And then he gives the redemption money, which we'll soon see what that is, to the Kohen. 
If it's the firstborn redeeming himself, you make a little different text blessing. You say, Hashem commanded us to redeem the firstborn, not about redemption. As the Ramam said in the book, the second book of the Ramam, the laws of blessings, whenever you make a blessing for yourself, you say it with a lamed in front, liftos. And he also makes shechianu. This mitzvah applies in every place and every time. It's an eternal mitzvah. How much is the redemption amount? Five silver coins. Actual silver coins of the day. Today we use five silver dollars. Because it says in the verse, Ufduyav mi ben tifde. It's, or his redemption you should redeem from a month old. This is the context is talking about um, redeeming a firstborn son. And it says you do, it, you do it once he's one month old. And the verse ends off, You give the value of five silver shekels. You can use whether regular silver or something which has equivalent value. As long as it's movable property, which has intrinsic value. Just like the shkalim mentioned in the verse are movable property and have intrinsic value. The fichach, therefore, you cannot conduct a redemption with real estate. nor with slaves. Because they're compared legally to real estate. Nor can you redeem with an IOU note. Because the note doesn't have intrinsic value. So much so that if you redeem the firstborn using these things, he's not redeemed. What if the father didn't give the Kohen another IOU note? He wrote an IOU note. He wrote a note to the Kohen, I'm obligated to pay you five silver coins. The, the note goes into effect. You have to give him the five coins. But until you give the five coins, the son isn't redeemed. If a father gave a Kohen an article, that in the market, it's not worth five silver coins. But the Kohen accepted it, and he said, you know what, I'm accepting it as the worth of five silver coins. Hare b'noi padoi, that Amam controversially rules, that this works, and the son is redeemed. The Kesef Mishnah, Shulchan Aruch, argues on this, and he says, nope. Unless there's an actual situation where this article is worth five silver coins, the Kohen can't just say, I accept it as five. It's not five. And he would rule that it's not redeemed. Or that Amram rules that it is. If you divided the five silver coins amongst ten priests, you gave each one a half a silver coin worth. Whether you give them all at once or one after another, you've fulfilled your obligation. If the Kohen wanted to give back the redemption money, he can give it back. However, you cannot give it to the Kohen with the intention to take it back. If he did so and then the Kohen gave back the money, the son is not redeemed. Unless you decide fully to give him back as a gift. You give it to the Kohen as a gift. If the Kohen wants to return it of his own volition later, he could. Similarly, if you were explicit and you said, I'm giving it to you on condition that you give it back, the firstborn son is redeemed. All Kayanim and Levites, Pturim, Mipidyan, Aben, they are exempt from doing the firstborn redemption. Mikal Vachaymer, out of a what's called a fortiori argument, logical deduction. Im Patru shall Yisrael ba Midbar, Dinu shall Yiftru Atzman. If the Levites were able to exempt the Jewish firstborns in the desert, as we saw two weeks ago in the Parsha, that Hashem exchanged every firstborn for a Levite, so of course they can exempt themselves. Dinu shall Yiftru Atzman. And therefore today, if there's a Kohen and a Levi, and they have a son, no redemption. Not only that, Yisrael haba min akohenas min aleviyah. If the mom is the daughter of a Kohen, or the mom is the daughter of a Levite, and there's a Yisrael born from them, she married a regular Israelite, they had a son, Potter, they're also exempt from firstborn son redemption. She'en adavar tali ba'av ala ba'im. Because this mitzvah is not dependent on the father, only on the mother. Shenemar peter rechem bi Yisrael. It says, the opening of the womb in Israel. It's not actually a verse. There's two different verses that say Petr Kol Rechem Bivnei Yisrael or Petr Rechem Mi Bnei Yisrael. The Ramam just conglomerates. It says Petr Rechem Bi Yisrael. The point is, it has to be opening the womb. And that's the mom, not the dad. And therefore, even if the mom is a Levite or a Kohen, that exempts the kid. 
if a woman, Levite, is pregnant by a non-Jew, B'na Potter, her son is exempt from firstborn redemption because she's a Levi. On the other hand, a Kohen woman who's pregnant by a non-Jew, fascinatingly, her son has to be redeemed. Because her mother is disqualified from the Kohen lineage by the fact that she has had relations with a non-Jew, and now her kid is born from, so to speak, a regular Jewess and has to be redeemed. This would be another case, by the way, with the beginning of the chapter, the mom would redeem the son in this case, because she's the only Jewish one. If a Kohen had a son who was born to him, but not a Kohen, because he married a divorcee, let's say, and it's a firstborn. If the father died during the first 30 days of life, the, the son has to redeem himself later, because the father never acquired the redemption money. Even though he's a Kohen and could redeem his own son, technically, but he didn't live long enough to own that money. But once, if the father would die after 30 days of life of this halal, the son doesn't have to redeem himself, because the father already acquired the redemption. The father can say, hey, it's already as if I received the redemption of my own son. A maidservant that was freed and now becomes a full-fledged Jew. A non-Jewish woman who becomes a convert. But they were freed or became pregnant, uh, or, or converted, while they were pregnant, the Yaldo, and then they gave birth. Even though this boy was, impreg- was conceived, not in a holy state, his, his mom was not Jewish at the time, since he was born in a holy state, they're, they're obligated to redeem him. Shanemar, again the verse, the obligation goes, once he opens the womb in Israel, the opening and the womb was Jewish. If we don't know whether she gave birth before or after the conversion, not sure how you cannot know that. Maybe she did a water birth. She was in the mikveh and she gave birth, and we don't know if she gave birth before or after she dipped in the mikveh. When the Kohen comes and says, Hey, redeem your son, I want the money, he's expropriating. Because he's expropriating out of doubt, he will have to prove that the boy was born after conversion. If a non Jewish woman, or a non-Jewish maid servant gave birth, the Akharkachnis Gairu, Vinishtahru, and then they either converted or were emancipated, the Yoldu Vlad Akher, and they were they gave birth to another boy. Hariz a Potter, this boy is exempt, even though it's the firstborn Jewish son, but it says Shanemar Petar Rechem. You only get the obligation if you open the womb. The Ainze Petar Rechem. And this is not opening of the womb. He has an older brother. The Khin Habo Akhar on the Falim. So too, if a baby boy is born after a miscarriage, after a stillborn. Any case where the miscarriage, the stillborn, would have caused his mom to become impure by the birth impurity, which we had in the Ramam's fifth book, a boy that comes after him is not considered to have opened the womb. But if it's a type of stillborn, which wouldn't cause his mom to become impure by the birth impurity, for example, a woman miscarries in the shape of fish or grasshoppers, or she miscarries on the day 40, uh, of conception, the first 40, anywhere in the first 40 days. A boy that comes after him is considered to be firstborn with regards to the laws of Kohen, and he has to redeem the firstborn son. So unfortunately, it happened that the doctors felt that the baby needs to be killed in utero, and they cut the fetus while in the stomach, in the uterus. And it came out limb by limb. The baby that comes after this boy is not considered to have opened the womb. What if there was an eight-month pregnancy? In Talmudic times, either seven-month or nine-month pregnancies were considered viable. In the eighth month, it was actually considered non-viable. It was almost totally sure that it wouldn't die, that, 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 that it wouldn't last. So if you have an eight-month-old pregnancy, he crowned, he, he, his head exited the, the, the woman's body while alive, and then it returned its head, and then it died. Let's say also you have twins that came to full term at nine months. Um, one of them was dead, and it exited first with only its head, and then it returned its head. And then the brother, the twin brother that was still alive, came out, and she gave birth to him first. 
Zesha Yolda Eine Peterechem. In both of these cases, the one that gives birth here is not considered to be opening the womb. Shari Niftar Beresha Shalisha. The womb was open with the head of the first one, it was dead. Umishatetse Padachtai, Poitaraba Achrav. How much does it have to come out? Its forehead. As long as its forehead emerges, it's considered to have opened the womb and exempts the next boy. Halacha Tazayin Yetse Doifen. Cesarean section, Bahaba Acharav Kedarkoi. And then you have. Another boy comes out later, vaginally, naturally. Both boys are exempt. And the first one, although he's first born, but he didn't exit from the womb. And the second one, has someone came before him. And therefore, they're both exempt. At what point does the boy have to be redeemed? Once he concludes 30 days of life. Shanemar, as it says, return to the same verse, Ufduyav mi ben chaydash tifta. His redemption should happen from the one month old. Meis haben b'seich shleishim. If God forbid the son dies within 30 days. Ma'afilu biyayim shleishim, even on the 30th day. V'cheinim nasa treif, or he becomes mortally wounded to the point that he won't last a year. Ein echayav b'chamei shleishim. He's not obligated in redemption. V'im higdim menasam l'kayin. If the father uh, prepaid the coin, the money, thinking that the kid's going to live, and then he died or became a treifa, and the Kohen must return the redemption money. But once the baby passes 30 days old, and even if it dies afterwards, and the father is obligated to redeem the baby, and if he didn't give the money yet, he must still give after the death. A person redeems his son during 30 days. If the words he used to the Kohen was, here, I want to redeem my son from now, the son isn't redeemed. But if he said, I want it to be redeemed after 30 days, so then the redemption only goes into effect after 30 days, and it works. Even if the Kohen uses the cash, and he's not holding the cash anymore, after 30 days, it doesn't matter. What if there's a boy who we're in doubt whether he's obligated in redemption or not, and we'll see, soon see a bunch of cases of doubt, but the, the governing principle is hareze pater. The doubt is exempt. Because the Kohen who wants to extract will have to prove that the son is for sure a Bukhar. If the dad dies during 30 days, one can presume that the son wasn't redeemed. Unless he can bring a proof from his father that he redeemed him before he died. But if the father dies after 30 days, we assume Jews do their job. The son can assume that he's been redeemed unless somebody notifies him clearly that he was not redeemed. Okay, now we go to the cases of doubt. Here we go. A person's wife had never given birth before. And now she has twins, top right case, a boy and a girl. We don't know. Which one came first? If the boy came first, he's obligated in Pidyan Aben. If the girl came first, then not. Ein kan la koyen klum. The Kohen has no claim here. Because he can always say, prove that my daughter wasn't born first. Yolda shnei But if she gave birth to twins, boys. Afal pishein yodua is a meyan Even if you don't know who is the firstborn. Neisin chamish shlayim la But certainly the Kohen gets five coins here. Because one of them is a b'chayim. If God forbid one of these twins were to die within 30 days, Potur. Now the, Kohen is, the father is exempt for the other one. Because only one baby. And the Kohen will have to prove that he is the one who was born first. If the father dies of these twins, whether before or after 30 days, whether the brothers divided the estate or not, Although neither one is clearly obligated, but the estate needs to pay five coins to the Kohen, because the property has already become obligated when the father was alive, to give at least one set of five silver coins to the Kohen. Till now we're talking about one wife. What if we have to consider the case of two wives? We have two wives, neither of them ever gave birth before. And they bore a total of two males. So, of course, even if we don't know which baby belongs to which mom, both babies are firstborn. And he must give ten silver coins to the coin. If one of them dies 
during 30 days. If he gave the 10 coins to one coin, let him simply give back five coins. But if he gave it to two separate koanim, he cannot take the money back from either koan. Because he didn't specify which money goes for which kid. And every koan can say, hey, get back from my friend. He's the one who got the money from the dead son. Not, not, not me. Chavbez, a whole bunch of cases now with two wives. Here we go. Two wives, neither of them ever gave birth. And there are over here a total of a baby boy and a baby girl. Or two boys and one girl. So here, again, you don't know which person gave birth to which, but certainly one of the moms had a boy first. Remember, same day, different days. The point is, the, the point is, right? Because in, in this case, one of them had a boy, one of them had a girl. So he's obligated in five. In this case, e- one of them had twins. Okay? So in either scenario, let's say, let's say she had a girl and she had the two boys. So one of the boys is a bachar. Let's say she had just a boy and she had a boy and a girl. So even if the girl is born for, first over here, but there's a boy bachar. Right, yeah. Certainly if the, boy, if, the boy, if the boy was born to her, first, and the boy was born to her first, then we'd be obligated in ten. But we can only hold you accountable for five over here. Right? You must give for sure five coins to the Kayin. There's no way that at least one of the boys opened one of the wombs. But if it's a scenario where there was two girls and a boy... Or two boys, two girls. And you don't know which one came first. The Kayan can't take anything over here. Because we can always attach the two girls to the two moms as coming first. Because I'll say the girl was born first. And then the boy in both scenarios. Now it gets more complicated. You have two, two wives. Achas bikra, the achas loy bikra. One already has a boy, as over here, and one never had a boy, never had any kids. The yoldu shnei zacharim v'nisarvu. They have two boys, and they got mixed up. We don't know which belongs to which. Neisin chamish sloyim lakayin. The father certainly has to give five coins to the kohen because this woman certainly had a firstborn son. If one of the babies died during thirty days, ha'av pater, the father is exempt. Because he can always say, prove to me that it wasn't this woman's son that died. If the father dies, the estate must provide five coins, because again, one of them is for sure obligated to be redeemed. If these two women combined gave birth to a total of a boy and a girl, or even two boys and a girl, the coin has no claim. Because I can say, the woman who had never given birth before, even if she had twins, maximum. Maybe she had the girl first and the boy. And the other boy was born by the woman who had already given birth to a boy, and therefore he's not a firstborn, so the father has no obligations at all. Now we're mixing the scene even more. There's two husbands involved and two wives. So, two men are married, each one to one woman. Shaloi Bikru, both women never having had a child before. And they had two boys in total, and they got mixed up. Either way, both fathers have to give five coins. Because their wife, for sure, had a firstborn son, even if you don't know which is your son. Nosnu, if they gave the coins, and then one of the boys died during 30 days. So same principles. If they give the money to two koanim, neither father can expropriate the money because each koanim will say, I, I'm holding the money of the live son. If they gave it to one koan, so technically here, also they can't get it because the koan will tell each man, prove that it's not your son. But what happens is, one of the fathers will write power of attorney to the other father. And he'll go with the power of attorney and get back from the Kohen at least five coins. Say, look, 
me and the other guy together, we want those five coins back. And they'll divide a two and a half, two and a half. Chav Zayin, same case. Two men, two women. Yoldu Zacharun Nekeva Vinis Arva. They gave birth to a boy and a girl, and they got mixed up. Now, somebody had a firstborn son here. However, because you don't know, Ha'avais Paturin. The fathers are exempt. The Ha'ben Chayov Liftis Azatzmai. The son, when he grows up, he's a firstborn son. He has to redeem himself. The Chayn Mevakeres. Same thing, if you have a woman giving birth for the first time. She didn't wait after terminating a relationship with her first husband for three months as she should have. She got married during the three months again. And then she got, gives birth. You don't know if the baby is a nine-month full-term pregnancy from the first husband or seven-month pregnancy from the second husband. Both fathers are exempt. But because the son is firstborn for sure from the mom, he has to redeem himself later. Chavches, returning to the other case, where two men, two women, they had two girls and a boy, or two girls and two boys. So again, in kan makayin klum, the kohen gets nothing here because in each case, the, the new mom could have given birth first to a girl. Chavtes, switch it up one more time. Again, two men, two women. But in this scenario, one of them already has a child, and only one of them is giving birth for the first time. So if they gave birth to two boys, so of course, the husband whose wife never gave birth before has to give five coins to the Kohen. Once there's even one boy and one girl, the Kohen gets nothing because you can always say the boy belonged to this mom who already had a child and the girl belonged to the new mom and there's no obligation. Lamet. If there's two boys and a girl, so now there's a distinct possibility that this woman had a firstborn son. The one who doesn't have a firstborn does have to give five coins, even though maybe she had twins and maybe the girl was born first. But here we have what's called Svek Sveka, a double doubt. The only way to exempt this mom is with two doubts. In because if she gave birth to only one of the boys, he's obligated. And even if she gave birth to twins, a boy and a girl, she'd still be obligated if the boy was born first. Unless the girl was born first. Since in this scenario it's a very far, remote possibility, he must at least just give the payment, give the five coins to the coin, and do your due diligence to redeem your potential firstborn son.